All right, this is a culture from an aerobic blood culture bottle from a patient with a ruptured appendix. Now, the anaerobic bottle also came up positive on the, uh, the instrument, uh, but we're only working up one of them. So whenever a blood culture on an instrument comes up positive, you know, the alarm goes off, the tech goes over and turns the alarm off, pulls the bottle or bottles, and then the first thing that that person does is makes a gram stain, a direct gram stain of that blood. So that's what was done on this particular culture. And uh, <coughs> what the tech saw, uh, he saw, he saw gram negative rods. All right. So with a blood culture, a positive blood culture, you know, uh, we don't really think of microbiology as having panic values, you know, in other areas of the laboratory. For example, chemistry, if we have a low or a high uh, potassium or glucose or something like that, we know that we have to call the physician. But in the microbiology, there are definitely uh, panic values that need to be called to the physician, and a positive blood culture is one of them. So it, I'm, I'm sure it may depend on the institution, but you can, it's probably safe to say that after uh, you have done the gram stain of the bottle and you see gram negative rods, then you are going to call the physician and let that person know about this. Okay, so that was yesterday. The blood culture came up positive yesterday. That gram stain was made. Uh, it was red. The physician was called. And then the culture was set up. All right, so today we're looking at a sheep blood, a chocolate, and a McConkie's. Now, some facilities may also throw a CNA plate in. Uh, these are just the plates that I use in my teaching laboratory. So let's go ahead and take a look at them and see what we have. Let's go ahead and take a look at the sheep blood here first. Okay, now similarly to spinal fluid, uh, blood is a sterile body site. It's a sterile body fluid, and we wouldn't expect any type of normal flora. Um, but what happens oftentimes if proper technique is not used in the process of collecting a blood culture, we can get contamination. So, uh, you know, the needle that's used to collect the specimen goes through the skin. So it's, uh, it's possible that we can have contaminants, but just often when that happens, usually just one of the blood culture bottles comes up positive. But in this case, uh, we, we see that both are positive and we have a gram negative rod. That would be very unusual to be a contaminant. And in this case, we're not going to assume that this is a contaminant. Okay, so it looks like just one colony type, just kind of these large grayish colonies. And you can see here that they kind of have like a couple zones. You have this inner zone and then an outer zone. And I don't see any hemolysis on these. Let's go ahead and take a look at the chocolate. Okay, these look very similar to what we have on the sheep blood plate. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, McConkie's plate. All right, now the fact that we don't have very many isn't of any significance because when it comes to things like spinal fluid and blood cultures, uh, we're not quantitating how much is there. Just the simple fact that it is, an organism is there is, an, is, is enough. So uh, as we know with McConkie auger, this is an auger that is selective and differential, and it's selective for gram-negative organisms. And when I say gram-negative, I am, am really talking exclusively about members of Enterobacteriaceae and probably Pseudomonas. I'm not talking about uh, gram-negative organisms like Haemophilus or Neisseria or Moraxella. Those are too fastidious. They would never thrive or grow on uh, a McConkie's plate. <coughs> so uh, due to the fact that we do have growth here, we can probably make the assumption that this is a gram-negative rod. It's probably a member of Enterobacteriaceae or Pseudomonas. Now, on McConkie's, we always have to comment on the organism's ability to use lactose, which is the sugar in McConkie's. So we say, if it's clear, we call it lactose negative or a lactose non-fermenter. And if it's pink, it's lactose positive or a lactose fermenter. So this, these particular colonies are lactose negative. All right, so what are we going to do here? Uh, it's really a pretty straightforward workup. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm recovering from uh, the flu and a cold. Um, 
it's pretty clear cut here what we're going to do. We only have one colony type. We have a gram negative rod. Uh, it's growing on the McConkie's plate. Now the first test that we always do is what in this situation? It's an oxidase. Okay. So uh, an oxidase test is a color-based test. So we're not going to do it off the McConkie's plate. We would never do the oxidase off of McConkie's because if these colonies were pink, they may interfere with the color of the of the test result in the oxidase test. So we're going to do it off the sheep blood or the chocolate. Now, just using my experience, I'm guessing that these are uh, probably going to be lactose negative, uh, sorry, lactose negative, oxidase negative. Uh, Pseudomonas, especially Pseudomonas aeruginosa, would have more, it would be flatter, it would have more of a sheen, it would smell a little, kind of have this sweet smell. What I see here, characteristic of these colonies, is a slight swarming uh, feature. So we have this inner colony zone, and then we have an outer one. So uh, just assuming that it's lact, it's uh, sorry, oxidase negative, that would put it in the in the group of Enterobacteriaceae. And even if it were oxidase positive, it's still going to basically get the same workup. And that means that we're going to go ahead and, and uh, put this on an instrument for identification and susceptibility testing. All right, so uh, I need to send out a preliminary report on this. Uh, and um, what we're going to say is probable Enterobacteriaceae identification and susceptibility testing to follow.